So welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Julia Rothkopf, and I'm the program associate at YIVO. Today, we have Roy Ginsberg joining us for a Max Weinreich Fellowship Lecture in East European Jewish Literature. His research was funded by the Vladimir and Pearl Heifetz Memorial Fellowship and the Vivian Lepsky Hort Memorial Fellowship. For those of you who do not know YIVO, we are a very special place for the celebration, contemplation, and exploration of Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture. We are located in New York City, where our library and archive contain over 24 million documents and 400,000 books. These resources are used by scholars from all around the world. We also have lots of programs just like this one, where we aim to bridge the worlds of our of Jewish culture and our large our library and archival holdings. And today we are very excited to have you joining us for today's lecture. Um, Roy Ginsberg is a PhD candidate in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Harvard University. His research interests revolve around Russian and Yiddish modernisms and the role of the arts and literature in creating and redefining ideological identities over the course of the 20th century. He is currently working on his dissertation project, Building the Rotten Far Bond, Monumentalizing the Soviet Utopian Project Through Yiddish Art and Literature. And now I will hand it over to Roy. Hey, thank you so much, Julia, for that warm introduction. And before I begin, I just wanted to thank Dr. Portnoy and everyone at YIVO for inviting me to their archives and to present my research today. I'd also like to thank my advisors, professors past and present, and colleagues that are in attendance, and also my families and friends, uh, most importantly, my parents who are able to join in to the Zoom lecture. As Julia mentioned, this talk will present portions from the first two chapters of my dissertation, and today I will demonstrate how the writer Peretz Markish used poetic form to create literary monuments that mimic the violent, profane, and revolutionary developments that took place in Eastern Europe over the course of the 1920s, and also to signify pivot points in the evolution of the poet's ideological thought. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. So my dissertation is titled Building the Rodin for Bond, Monumentalizing the Soviet Utopian Project Through Yiddish Art and Lit Literature. I'll begin by providing a brief biography of Peretz Markish, who was born on December 7th, 1895 in Polonia, Volhynia, modern day Ukraine. Markish was raised in a poor but observant household and received the traditional cheder education. He ran away from home before the age of 12 and worked a variety of jobs, ranging from synagogue choir boy to bank employee. He was drafted into the Russian Imperial Army, where he was wounded fighting in World War I. Markish began writing Russian poetry at the age of 15 and only began to write in Yiddish during the war. His first poetry collection, Shvelin, or Thresholds, was published in 1919 and met with praise that distinguished him as one of the most promising Yiddish modernist poets. The young Markish wrote manifestos and aesthetics, founded literary almanacs, and traveled across Europe into Palestine. He made a name for himself by following the path laid by the Russian avant-garde, and in particular, Vladimir Mayakovsky and the Russian futurists, who sought to break from and dispose of the literary traditions of the past and create what North Nina Guryanova is described as an art without rules. As Markish traveled across Europe, he came to embody the ideals of revolution in the hearts and minds of a younger generation of Eastern European Jewry. In 1926, Markish would permanently return to the USSR, where he settled in Moscow. After overcoming initial struggles to conform to the increasingly tightening constraints imposed on writers by the Stalinist regime, he would go on to enjoy a remarkably productive career as a Soviet writer eventually becoming the only Yiddish writer to receive the Order of Lenin Prize. He thrived in the 30s and during the war when his Jewish texts and cultural influence were used to garner international support for the Soviet war effort. However, by the mid 40s, Stalin began to view these same texts as increasingly Jewish nationalist, and this ultimately led to Markish's arrest in January 1949 and execution on August 12, 1952, during the Night of the Murdered Poets. And I have here a screenshot that I took from the YIVO archives of an illustration for the second volume of Markish's literary almanac, the Chaliastra, or the Gang. And as you can see, this was illustrated by the famous Jewish artist, Mark Chagall, something that I think really demonstrates and emphasizes the reach of Markish's influence during the early 1920s. 
Before I begin, I will provide a brief outline on the two sections of today's presentation, which is divided into two parts, the first being on the first chapter of my dissertation titled The Foundation of Revolution, Decoupe as a Literary Monument to Destruction. I seek answers to the questions, how does Marcus use formal elements to create a literary monument? What does he accomplish by writing in what I call a coin godal or priestly mode? And how did this pogrom poema turn into a foundation for revolution? The next section is titled Poetics of Arrival or Return, laying the path to industrial utopia in their Fetzegeter Kerman. In this section, I examine the questions as to why Marcus portrays the pursuit of industrial utopia in a different prophetic mode. How does the poet conflate Jewish and Soviet traditions to create a new mythology for the genesis of the USSR? And finally, I look into how the formal elements of Marcus's ode reflects the development of his ideological thought. So I will now begin with Die Kupa, which was written during the 19th, which was written as a wave of pogroms spread across the palace settlement in 1919 to 1920. The aftermath of the Horodich pogrom in particular led Markish to adjust and manipulate language in a manner that inverted existing literary convention and remapped the lexicon of what was once the sublime, that is, Judaic tradition, to better fit his world dominated by the profanity of pogrom violence, revolution, and civil war. In this pogrom poema, Markish assumes the role of Koen Godel, or high priest to the mound, and structures his writing as an irreverent imitation of the Yom Kippur liturgy that includes new parables and lamentations, which are written in a variety of forms. Despite never visiting the scene of the pogrom at Horodich and witnessing its horrors firsthand, Marcus wrote Die Kupe to monumentalize the violence of the devastation in the Ukrainian shtetl for his readership. This act follows in the Jewish tradition of renewing life um, Sorry, I just lost my place. Of renewing life through scripture that dates to the destruction of the second temple. After the fall of the temple, Jewish life as it was had been destroyed, but the rabbis built it around the written Torah. For Eastern European Jewry, the pogroms had a similarly devastating impact that altered the lives and worldviews of those left in its wake. For a transient period, the physical mound in the Horodich marketplace functioned as a literal monument to this destruction constructed from the victims of pogrom violence. Markish's Kupe, through its formal innovations, acts as a literary monument that outlived the physical mound and served as a reminder of the pervasive violence and chaos of daily life for his readers. As the written Torah helped ritualize Jewish spiritual life following the destruction of the temple, the Kupe would ritualize su Jewish suffering long after the physical evidence of the Horodich pogrom had faded away. To convey the horrors of the pogrom to his readers, Markish manipulates oral and visual aesthetics to degrade the supposed elegance of poetry and contribute to the vulgarity of his work. In his opening sonnet, Markish immediately adjusts the formal aspects of his verse so that it resembles the mound in both sight and sound. He uses rhyme meter and perspective to contribute to his defamiliarized presentation of the haunting scene of the Ukrainian shtetl and intensify its affects. Instead of portraying the mound from the third person, he inserts himself directly into the mound and the slaughtered group of heap of slaughtered corpses, creating an estranged portrayal of pogrom violence, a horror that Eastern European Jewry had grown all too accustomed to. The term estrangement or astronenia comes from Viktor Sklovsky's essay, Artist Device, in which the formalist critic conceptualizes the letter, literary technique. As you can see, Sklovsky notes how Habitualization devours work, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. And art exists that when they recover the sensation of life, it exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony once more. Sklopsky notes that the technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar and forms difficult, to increase the difficulty and length of perception, because the process of perception is an aesthetic end in itself and must be prolonged. Art is a way of experiencing the artfulness of an art object. A work is artistically, is created artistically so that its perception is impeded and the greatest possible effect is produced. As a result of this lingering, the object is perceived not in its extension in space, but so to speak, in its continuity. 
Marcus creates a defamiliarized portrayal of the pogrom, not to allow his reader to recover the sensations of life, but to cause them to contemplate death anew. I will now read this opening sonnet in its original Yiddish. Nit, leknit hiliv himlesher meine farpat the bird, when meine meiler koipen broina richkes jagets, o broina roschen of von blut and von gesagets. Nit, reared nit dos gebrek of schwarzer dikt von der erd, a weck, a stinkt von mir, a skriken of mir fresh. Du suchst dein tata mama do, du suchst dein haver, ze seinen do, ze seinen do, nor stinkt von seinen aver. A weck, ze loisen sich, ze repete mit hens, ze beugen da wie mesh. A kupa quite great, von unten bin the biz of roif is. Na, wos der wild sich, du wind, trats a roi sum nem dir, an kegen sitz der kloister wie a treuer. A kupa wisch gestick da oif is. O hele wenn ich himmeln, eich so lange jord die schabestecke hender, und trot gesunterheit und nachis, alle, alle, jed alle, tischre tarpe. As the poet, poetic persona becomes one with the mound, so too does the sonnet's physical structure, which is perhaps most clear in examining the poem's metrical scansion, pictured here in classical notation. The poet's words, the raw material of his verse, work to break the second commandment, prohibiting graven images or any likenesses of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Marcus writes this sonnet in mixed iams, beginning with iambic hexameter in the first stanza, before transitioning to iambic heptameter and reaching lengths as long as iambic nanameter by the third. The poem's jagged lines become gradually wider at its base and narrower at the peak, imitating the mound's asymmetry and erratic construction. It begins with an initially consistent enclosed masculine feminine rhyme scheme, but even Marcus's rhymes contribute to the poem's unpleasant and gruesome tone. The feminine rhyme created by the words tar, jagets, and sawdust, gezergets, in lines two and three create a particularly guttural example as this combination of haf and sade makes for an extremely and almost impossible to pronounce consonant cluster. The first and fourth stanzas, the third and fourth stanzas exclusively feature feminine rhyme in a scheme of alternate pairs followed by a couplet. Both alternate rhymes are agrammatical and the exact rhyme between a roif is and oif is in lines 9 and 11 look even less natural when comparing the Yiddish words spelt in their original Hebrew lettering. Marcus ends the sonnet with an assonant couplet that creates a slant rhyme even more visually unappealing in lines 13 and 14, the words ala and tarpe. The imperfect rhymes at the bottom of the sonnet and the mound's base reveal terrestrial crudeness while the perfect rhymes at the top reflect the celestial harmony commonly associated with the heavens. The entire poem is visibly peculiar and unpleasant to recite, accentuating the uncomfortable disgust one would feel upon seeing the warped mound in the market square. In her chapter, Monuments to Revolutionary Estrangement from the 2010 work, Another Freedom, Solana Boyne revisits Shklovsky's conceptualization of Australia to ask the questions, what kind of monument to liberty and architecture of freedom emerges from the practices of estrangement and dissent in the 20th century? And then what are we to do with the ruins of their abandoned construction sites? Boyne suggests that Shklovsky's Ostranienia was never an estrangement from the world, but estrangement for the sake of the world's renewal. In the end, Shklovsky is not practicing literary science, but narrating the end of the literary public sphere. She interprets its conceptualization to be a theory of a new beginning in which revolutionary art becomes an art of dissent and artistic practice is transformed into a dangerous art of living. Beginning doesn't mean progress or a new myth of origin, but a possibility of unpredictable and creative renewal of vision, an unforeseen space of public architecture. Indeed, the Astronenia de Kupa is not an estrangement from Marcus's world when considering the circumstances of the time. The poet's harsh expressionist verse and chillingly warped imagery accurately depicted the existing atmosphere across the Ukrainian landscape ravaged by revolution, civil war, and pogroms. Throughout the Kufa, Marcus's mound competes with and is compared to monumental structures of biblical lore, both natural and man-made. These include the Tower of Babel, Mount Sinai, and Arat, the perceived landing place of Noah's Ark following the Great Flood. 
In poem 18, Marcus provides an image of the new moon appearing atop the mound. As a new arat, the mound appears to signify the dawn of a new era after a flood of violence. But a series of inconsistencies complicate this conventional interpretation. The appearance of the new moon contradicts the Hebrew lunar calendar. In his opening sonnet, Marcus dates the poem, the 11th of Tishrei, at which point the moon would have already been 11 days into its cycle. The poet's distortion of time rejects Jewish tradition in favor of a new chaotic order. The moon, or Moilid new moon, sits atop the mound like the ark, but is just beginning to load itself with pairs of decaying carcasses. Marcus uses the lotion coitus term, the vela, meaning carcass or carrion, terms that signify not rebirth and renewal, but death and decay. With the mound serving as its foundation, this new moon comes to symbolize the beginning of an era of degeneration and darkness. Metaphorically depicted by Marcus's chilling proclamation that the skin of the twilight lies slaughtered. The appearance of the mound overturns the natural order. As the poema progresses, Marcus amplifies the profane to allow the mound to eclipse the sublime in its monumentality and blanket the world with its destructive shadow. His kupa serves a similar function to Boehm's monuments to revolutionary estrangement, except renewal is predicated on violence and suffering. In depicting the mound's immensity, Marcus reappropriates symbols of natural and manufactured wonder and distorts them to serve his caustic depictions of pogrom devastation. One notable example occurs in the 24th canto, when the mound grows so large as to block out the sun. The juxtaposition of the sublime awe of a solar eclipse with the profane grotesquery of the mound instills in readers a disorienting effect. The wonder and miracle of the solar eclipse is caused directly by the Kupa, which obscures the, mound, the sun with blood and pus. Linguistic signifiers and contradictions further add to the pessimism and gloom created by Marcus's vulgar imagery. In line 17, the exclamation, a wonder, a wonder, a miracle, establishes an expectation for something positive or miraculous before introducing a foreboding Likakema or solar eclipse, deemed by Talmudic interpretations to be a bad omen that should raise concern for those enthralled by its darkness. The mound gains this power to create the eclipse, an otherworldly phenomenon once considered to be a direct sign from God. The implications at hand are twofold. The solar eclipse is man-made in the sense that it was men who constructed the mound, and that the mound was also literally built from human carcasses. The ardor with which Marcus extols the kupa and treats it as a divine entity obscures the fact that the heap of corpses was the result of this pogrom violence. Paradoxically, the mound exists at once as a direct representation of the mortality of the individual and the immortality of collected suffering, collective suffering. In this new world of darkness, Marcus takes on the persona of the Koyan Godel, or high priest to the mound, and crowns its sovereign over all the mountains. Meres beshert dein koyen godel sein, wie in a mischken, meres beshert bei dir zu dienen die avoida, von gorde der Welt, von Erden, von Himmlen, von Malke über alle Berg, weil ich dich kupe kreunen. These excerpts appear in the eighth canto, another sonnet featuring an array of assonant pairs and slant rhymes. The blatant imperfections of these rhymes suggest a lack of harmony in Marcus's world and add to its disorder. Marcus embraces his role as the mound's coin godel to both undermine the beauty of poetic convention and call into question the viability of religion. In the next canto, he subverts the, te subverts the tenets of Judaism by hijacking one of its most essential promises, that of messianic redemption. The path towards spiritual redemption comes not upon the arrival of a messiah figure, but of the mound. Marcus's poetic persona, Kumkoyen Godel, seeks to wake the corpses in a sardonic, sardonic play on the concept of Tchias Hamnesim, or the resurrection of the dead. The imperative, state oif su avoidas haboira, would have traditionally been spoken by the shamus, or beetle, who was tasked with calling the Jews for morning prayer and would do so by walking around the shtetl, knocking on doors. Notably, the avoida is also a key component of the Yom Kippur liturgy, in which Jews remembered the rituals and rites performed in the second temple before its destruction. According to the Talmud, Jews are obligated to study the Koyan Godel's ritual so long as the temple remains destroyed. The profane significance of this call for reanimation is multifold. 
Contrary to established harbingers of resurrection, Marcus makes this command neither upon the reconstruction of the temple nor the coming of the Messiah. He declares it upon the appearance of the Kuva. But the poet does not wish to resurrect the dead into the world to come. He commands the corpuses to stand in the world left behind, a chilling theme that would recur throughout the entirety of his career. Writing this coin godel, Marcus implicates his readers in the mound's profanity by manipulating poetic form to subvert religious tradition. His poema ends where it begins, with a sonnet that is a near mirror image of the opening one. The poet makes only a few changes to the final two stanzas that emphasize the fact that he, along with everyone else, are there in the mound. The repetition in line 12, mir seinen do, mir seinen do, mir alle. We are all here, we are all here, we all are. Stresses the scope of pogrom violence and implicates Markish and his readers as victims to it. Markish ends his poema with the exclamation, su gott's nomen, omen, or to God's name, amen. As in, yeah, as in the opening sonnet, he writes this poem in mixed iams with the same consistent, albeit orally unpleasant and closed rhyme schemes. These last two lines, however, break the pattern by creating an agrammatical assonant pairing that is noticeably off the rhythm. Jewish custom calls for an extended and pronounced articulation of the second syllable, the word omen, and Markish manipulates this custom to place his readers in an uncomfortable position. They must either pronounce a short rushed omen to adhere to the poem's master, poet's metrical scheme, or a longer, more emphatic omen in response to his profaned Yom Kippur liturgy as the mound's coin godel. Markish's omen appears awkwardly with a presence that contradicts both the formal structure and narrative content of the poema. As Markish's poem subverts the foundations of Jewish faith, it also alludes to a transition to more Bolshevik ideological thought. The poet emphatically forsakes Judaism in poem 26, in which the mound hurls the Ten Commandments back at Mount Sinai. Marcus's description of the mound of its smoking mouth like a glowing crater emphasizes its explosive potential, and this portrayal of fire and smoke resembles the setting at Mount Sinai as God descended upon Moses to give him the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19. However, instead of commandments, Marcus's poetic persona receives the mound's gezeira, or decree, a term referring to punishment inflicted by God and intimately linked to Yom Kippur when God completes the judgment of his people. In delivering this gzeira, Marcus's poetic persona becomes complicit in this most extreme rebuke of God's authority to judge and punish. The mound's hurling of the Ten Commandments back at Mount Sinai is a symbolic act that rejects the pillars of Judaism. As Sinai acted as the site of divine revelation for Moses, Marcus's kupa becomes the peak from which the poetic persona would devote himself to a socialist cause. This transition already became apparent in the preceding canto, in which the downtrodden poet in Koyan Goldel pledges his heart for a red amulet, the restless red and bloody flag. Markus envisages an alternative path to redemption through aligning himself with the red flag of socialism. His persona's oath marks a shift in tone in which he expresses a hope to recapture the dawn from the mound's world of darkness. Vitally, Markish views the socialist struggle not as an external source, force, but as a movement to which he can actively contribute. Moving forward, the poet would increasingly employ his poetics to portray not the gloom and destruction wrought by the mound, but the potential for redemption through the establishment of an international workers' utopia. At this point, I'll transition to Markish's 40-year-old man. Though it was never published during his lifetime, Der Fetzegitter Kerman is considered the poet's most, one of the poet's most enigmatic contributions to the corpus of common turn art and literature that appeared in the Soviet Union and across the world during the 1920s and 30s. Written during, primarily between 1920 and 1930, Markish's long poem is separated into two parts structurally and thematically. The first describes the inescapable societal depravity surrounding Marcus's poetic persona as he ventures to find the 40-year-old man. And the second portrays the conditions leading to violent upheaval of industrial revolution and its aftermath. The poet uses the odic genre form and prophetic mode to create a framework for the installment of a proletarian internationalism. 
His text acts as an ideological guide that seeks not to legitimize the viability of a specific communist state or nation, that is the Soviet Union, but to substantiate the worker's utopian ideal. Through his persona's perseverance, Markish demonstrates the strength of this ideology to withstand surrounding chaos and violence in the 1920s and its potential to lead its followers to industrial utopia or Markish's reimagined promised land. My research examines how Markish uses the prophetic mode, biblical symbolism and intertexts and poetic form to present the proletarian internationalist project as unrealized prophecy. A major question that I must consider in my research is to what extent Markish's 40 year old man might be read as an allegory, not just for the 1920s, but for the poet's own life. To answer this question, I've consulted accounts of Markish's life abroad before 1926 and his wife Esther's memoir, The Long Return, which tells the poet's life in the USSR and his family's struggles to emigrate to Israel following his death. This quote comes from the lesser known poet, Esther Rosenfall Schneiderman, and demonstrates the full extent to which Marcus personified revolution in the 1920s. Referring to one of his notoriously raucous public readings in Warsaw, Schneiderman comments that, we saw in him the messenger of the new Jew from over there, from the other side of the red border. Markish was the only Yiddish writer who knew what he wanted, and the first Yiddish writer who spoke to us in Warsaw loud and clear in the name of the October Revolution. In Poland, Markish gave the impression that he personally, in his fiery speeches and his poetic utterances, represented the revolution. Even after Markish's execution, his wife Esther defended the poet's de decision to return to the USSR in 1926, noting that he exalted the Soviet regime, not for personal gain or out of opportunity, but because it was his unshakable conviction that the regime had emancipated his people, had turned, torn down the walls of the ghetto so that they, his people, could blossom anew and flourish in an atmosphere of freedom. Esther Markish continues that with every fiber in his blood and with all the tenderness of his soul, Peretz Markish was attached to the Jewish culture diaspora. He believed in the vitality in its vitality as he believed in a long and glorious future for the Jews of Russia. With these details of Markish's life in mind, I make the argument that the poet wrote the 40-year-old man seeking similar emancipation for the rest of his people, along with all others who had yet to arrive in the territory of the Soviet Union and its budding workers' internationalist utopia. Before beginning my analysis of the text itself, I would like to quickly clarify who the 40-year-old man might be and what he might represent. It is important to note that the man's identity is never revealed. However, his absence pervades the first half of Markish's long poem and much of the second. There's also a multifold significance of the number 40 in Jewish culture, perhaps most notoriously the 40 years of wandering in the desert in Exodus, and also the fact that at the age of 40, Man is thought to transition to the next level of wisdom, the level of bina, and may ca practice Kabbalah. Also, Markish's poetic persona's journey may be interpreted not as one toward the 40-year-old man, but as one to becoming the 40-year-old man. In this sense, Markish's persona resembles that of Dante's from Dante's Inferno, which begins midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in some dark woods for I had wandered off from the straight, straight path. It should be noted that like Dante's persona, Marcus himself was 35 when he had finished writing the majority of this long poem. As Marcus's poetic persona follows a path towards the titular 40 year old man, his spatial movements through scenes of ubiquitous chaos and subjugation are obscure and less pronounced than the temporal changes that are abundantly apparent and portrayed in an ostensibly biblical style. Generations cycle in and out as the persona laments unrewarded labor under conditions of violent societal transformation. The poet writes in a prophetic mode as conceptualized by Don Maron to substantiate the history of worker struggle as it continuously develops into his present day. Maron defines the prophetic mode in his analysis of 20th century Hebrew poetry and traces it back to Chaim Nachman Bialik, who strove as much as was possible within a European and non-biblical formal context to emulate and reproduce the tonality of biblical prophecy. Though Markish wrote in Yiddish, I argue that he too adopts a prophetic mode in the tradition of Bialik, but to legitimize not Zionism, 
but a new mythology of proletarian struggle and present the ultimate goal of industrial workers utopia, an ideal to continuously believe in and strive for. As an Eastern European Jewish intellectual, Markish was born into a nation without a land, but a fixation on the book and the temple. The Fertzik Yerikerman envisions not the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, but the construction of the factory as a fulfillment of a different proletarian messianism. Though it would take some time for Marcus to establish thematic connections between his work and his biblical intertexts, he immediately develops formal connections in his opening canto. As he does throughout the majority of part one of his ode, he sets this poem in an incantatory and apestic tetrameter metrical scheme organized into a series of masculine rhyming couplets. Omitted consonants in the word final position caused the rhymes to be imperfect and engender feelings of lack, the absence of the 40-year-old man. Nevertheless, Marcus's regular metrical scheme adds an energetic formal elegance to his verse that calls to mind Lord Byron's famous poem, The Destruction of Sennacherib, from the Hebrew Melodies Collection. Byron's poem, originally published in 1815, is based on the biblical account of the Assyrian king Sennacherib's attempted siege of Jerusalem in 701 BC, as described in Isaiah 36 to 37. As Isaiah serves partially as thematic inspiration for Marcus's epic, epic, Byron's poem provides the formal template as demonstrated by its first stanza. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rose nightly on deep Galilee. Though Byron wrote his poem in quatrains, it is 24 loins long, like Marcus's, and consists of exclusively masculine rhyming couplets, also like Marcus's. The 19th century Russian poet Alexei Tolstoy translated Byron's The Destruction of Senator Cherub into Russian in 1858. Tolstoy's popular Russian translation was also written in anapestic tetrameter and set in masculine rhyming couplets. Assyriania shli kaknastada valki, bagretse i khuslat, it is likely that Markish would have been much more familiar with this Russian translation than the English original. Paul Fussell notes that the anapestic rhythm of Byron's poem has a feel of the beat of a galloping horse's hooves as the Assyrian rides into battle. For Markish, the rhythm mimics not a galloping horse, but the step of his persona ascending the mountain to find the 40-year-old man. A desire to situate the self between the temporalities of past, present, and future pervades the journey of Markish's poetic persona, who longs to build an industrialized society that is both inclusive of and accessible to those who have contributed to its creation, those who have toiled and suffered in the past and who will labor in the future. Breaking from the contemptuous disregard for the past and future in his earlier works, Marcus exhibits a newfound maturity and proactivity in ensuring the well being of generations prior and yet to come by seeking to secure their spot in a rapidly changing society. He acknowledges the gravity of his position in Poem 9. His use of abstraction to generate obscure landscapes amplifies the, the affect generated by the image of a funeral horse dragging a wooden wagon carrying the past generation, sordidly covered by a beggar's sack. His description of the light blue edge makes it seem as if his wagon exists not on land, but water. The poet provides few details regarding the setting to direct focus to the dreary cycle of generational turnover, saying, I welcomed the generation in and ushered a generation out. In its ambiguity, the 12 hunched old men may also allude to either the 12 sons of Jacob the 12 apostles, or Alexander Bloch's 12 red guards, all designations that the poet views as fading into the past. 
Again, perhaps most importantly, the first line of this canto also establishes an intertextual connection to Ecclesiastes, introducing one of the central conflicts in Marcus's work. And as we see in Ecclesiastes line four, one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Marcus's prophetic mode is unique in that it extends beyond his Yiddish readership and gives voice to the global proletarian struggle. In the world of his epic, traditional Jewish exile becomes a universal burden that his poetic persona and all workers struggle to overcome. The poet makes direct references to Jewish biblical and early Soviet history to represent this exile as modern and universal. In this example from part one, poem 28, Marcus creates a bizarre depiction of Jacob's ladder, the staircase to heaven that appear in, appeared in Jacob's dream. In Genesis 28, Jacob envisions angels unsuccessfully attempting to ascend ladders to heaven. Marcus prevent, presents a more peculiar image. According to rabbinic interpretation, Jacob's ladders might symbolize the exiles that the Jewish people are to suffer before the coming of the Messiah. The first angel climbs 70 rungs before falling down, representing the 70-year Babylonian exile, the time during which the book of Isaiah was composed. Notably, terms of the form vait or distance appear 70 times over the course of the 40-year-old man. That this may appear coincidental, the Odes biblical modus operandi lends itself to this type of exegesis. The numerical equivalence links the distance associated with Marcus's dispersed exiles to the heights, which in his writing will ultimately signify not the heavens, but the smokestacks and chimneys of industrialization. Marcus portrays the angels as dwarfs to emphasize how years of war, pogroms, and revolution has beaten them down. And their struggles to climb the ladders suggest that they are not yet capable of ending this generational struggle to escape their exile. In part two of his work, Marcus repurposes his poetics and use of symbolism to more directly allude to a modern Soviet history. He inconspicuously sets the second half in the 1920s, further connecting the story to the international emergence of socialism and the rise of a Soviet industrial society. Though these historical details are often hidden within the layers of abstract verse and enigmatic parables, he subtly yet unambiguously transposes his semantic fields, dichotomies of distance and closeness of night and day, etc., onto a Soviet topography. Marcus conflates the uniquely Jewish with the Soviet universal to mythologize the genesis of the USSR and attempted creation of a communist internationale. In this regard, the Yiddish poet builds upon earlier efforts by Vladimir Mayakovsky and Vladimir Klebnikov to, in the words of Hersh Aram, generate a planetary internationalism of aesthetic form commensurate with world revolution. Ram makes this proposition in his analysis of Khlebnikov's super saga, Zangasi, which stood as an immensely ambiguous attempt to generate an artistic form and a set of constructive principles equal to global resonance of revol Russian revolution. And it should also be noted that Zangasi was written in Khlebnikov's own um, manner of a prophetic mode. In part two, poem seven, Markish notes mountainous youths, youths from the steppe, coming to construct cities, an allusion to the Soviet mass construction efforts of the 1920s. Throughout the 40-year-old man, Markish emphasizes the role that children play in the development of the world. His youths from the steppe represent the legions of Central Asian workers that moved across the USSR to build the Soviet industrial centers. For the first time, Markish identifies their concrete contributions to the Soviet workers' utopian project. His descriptions of these youths might be portrayed as orientalizing. The decision to emphasize their sun-browned and bronze-dazzled skin marks an otherness, especially for Markish's primarily Ashkenazic readership. Yet the poet does not orientalize malevolently. malevolently. Instead, he views these youths as abruptly uprooted, as is evidenced by their bodies like chestnut trees and hands like branches. Just two pages later, in poem nine, Markish portrays these youths as a cohesive unit and fervent contributors to the Soviet project through their involvement in the pioneers. The saying repeated in line 22, 
Ständig great, always ready, or in Russian, Sigda Gatov, was the official slogan of the pioneers, the mass youth organization founded by Lenin in 1922. As the poem shifts to more contemporary historical mode in part two, new ideologies begin to take shape and insert themselves into Marcus's text. The poet continues to emphasize the fervent involvement of the children from the peripheries, from east, from south, from other directions in the development of this Soviet industrial project. He treats all these children as equals, noting that it is not the coloring of their skins, of their body and skins, of their bodies and skin. Everyone is born from toil and want, another call back to Ecclesiastes. The children are united in part by their oppression, but Marcus stresses their collective potential and the enthusiasm of their message emanating from brown lips, from sparkling teeth, dazzling and sparkling from everyone all the same. The last line of this poem is particularly significant as Marcus's poetic persona, who had previously been destined alone to be the coy and godel to the mound, using the first, first person singular pronoun, mir is beshert dein coy and godel zaun, and is now fated to help contribute together in the development of industrial utopia. Un uns, un die letzte soll sein ist beshert, a gort, a getreia. In the conclusion to Marcus's work, the poet definitively overlays his abstract expressionist geopoetics onto the territory of the Soviet Union. In part two, poem 34, the mountainous Caucasus cry out to the Urals as wave after wave defiles the mountains with no signs of remorse. The poet uses graphic imagery, gendered language, and anthropomorphism and his, and his depiction of the Soviet landscape to suggest that the mountains and mineral res reserves are giving themselves up to the workers, that they are calling to be raped. The poet employs an explicitly sexual modifier to describe how the wounds of the earth, virginly or young Freudish, cry out for his readers to come and demand the desire, begert und verlangt. He depicts this scene in a manner that demonstrates the full extent to which the new makers of Soviet society long for and even eroticize the realization of its industrial utopian project. The, ver the verbs began to desire, crave, or covet, and for longing or to demand, can both carry sexual connotations and imply a longing, which can represent both the delayed gratification finally achieved after an extended period of pain and suffering and the more sinister, violent form of erotic retribution. The waves represent Marcus's youthful exiles and wanderers who at long last converge upon the poetic persona. Marcus portrays this ravaged landscape in a manner evocative of Psalm 46, in which the waters that once carried the mountains into the sea transform into a calm river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. In Marcus's reimagining of the psalm, these waves serve not the city of God, but the factories and the plants in an emerging industrial center. In Psalm 46, the city of God is scattered with tabernacles. Marcus's poem only mentions smokestacks protruding into the sky. These smokestacks contrast with the tabernacles, both in their height and in their permanence. The ancient Jews constructed low-rising tabernacles based on specifications handed to Moses by God himself and used them during their time and weren't wandering in the desert and during the Babylonian exile. As the construction and reconstruction of the temple made these portable tabernacles obsolete, the smokestacks rising from Marcus's factories signify a sense of permanence to the worker exile's arrival at the industrial center. The appearance of mine shafts, which extend deep into the ground, are yet another indicator of permanence and a callback to Marcus's allusion to Jacob's ladder in which the wager over which dwarf will ascend their ladder higher and quicker spreads across the valley. Instead of focusing on movement upwards towards the heavens, the valley is now concerned with going downward to extract the earth's resources. Unlike ladders, which are portable and easily moved, like tabernacles, mine shafts are lasting and stationary. Their presence in the Urals and the Caucasus suggests that Marcus's worker exiles have established permanent roots in their new industrial center. Most significantly, the goal of going down into the earth reflects a full reversal of the previous preoccupation with reaching God in the heavens, 
and the sexual imagery of the mine shafts extending into the ground and the smokestacks gullets protruding upwards further contributes to the violent eroticism of Marcus's verse. In part two, poem 37, Marcus creates yet another biblical in inner text as the imagery of mountains walking and valleys hastening to serve the people recalls that of Psalm 114. The mountains skip like rams and the hills like lambs in which the nation of Israel embarks out of Egypt and into what would become the kingdom of Judah. The psalm, recited during times of celebration, tells of the earth's obedience to God and the Jews as they arrived at their predestined homeland. Marcus borrows this idea that the land will serve in the establishment of a realized promised land, but repurposes it to demonstrate that the land will serve not a specific nation, but the process of industrialization. Most significantly, the valley and the mountain, the two topographical points that define the outer limits of Marcus's abstract expressionist geography, converge upon one another and unite to serve this industrial utopian project. Marcus balances optimism for the future with a keen understanding of the devastation wrought upon the land. In part two, poem 34, he notes the bloody nail set itself under the earth's body. He continues to depict the earth using feminist modifiers and forms through dark messianic imagery. And in poem 36, notes the world's wreath of thorny wire. Thinking back to poem 34, in which Marcus situated this epic in the territory between the Caucasus and the Urals, it becomes clear that the poet uses images of Christian messianic sacrifice to portray the early Soviet motherland as a Christ-like figure that has given herself up for the advancement of industrial utopia. For Marcus, the promise of the common turn is born out of the defilement of the territory of the Russian or Soviet state. He continues to employ gendered language to accentuate the erotic nature of violence wrought upon the land. The poet portrays the world, the Soviet motherland, not as a victim of Christ-like sacrifice, but of assault, with her wounded flesh still dripping and barefoot steps on broken glass. His poetic persona calls upon readers to embrace the abandoned world slowly, for her wound is still fresh. The implication that past revolution, revolutionaries and industrializers ravaged their motherland demonstrates the full extent of their depravity, and Marcus demands his readers treat the land with more care and compassion. This leads to the final poem of Marcus's 80 canto work, in which the poet reveals a cautious optimism and attempts to embrace a new ideology of industrialization. Though they do not arrive in the traditional promised land, the workers, young and old, are united in their labor. With this conclusion, Marcus settles the many conflicts of time and space defined by the earlier parts of his epic. Days pass, but the challenge remains and unites the people under a common goal. The distances are connected by a vast forest, forest of chimneys that call to one another over the heights, and where an ox once trudged in burden, now goes a tractor in a second and another. This image of tractors working in the distance contrasts starkly with that picture from part one, in which a funeral horse pulls past generations beyond the horizon. With this poem, Marcus settles the seemingly perpetual struggle with the dawn and provides a resolution to Cahelet's millennia-old laments in Ecclesiastes. Marcus's workers, united by a common goal, have found an escape from exile through their embrace of the proletarian internationalist ideology embodied by the refrain, a workshop with a workshop with a workbench or workbench. The refrain appear, repeated in slightly different variants in line 12 and 24, replaces the poetic persona's addresses to the 40-year-old man and signifies the focus has shifted from finding the man to working toward future progress. Formally, in lines 12 and 24, the meter shifts from anapestic tetrameter that dominated part one to an amphibrachic tetrameter that would emerge as the dominant meter throughout part two, representing the poet's transition to this new industrial ideology. The concluding poem primarily features amphibrachs in the first half, though lines two, eight, and 12 still slip into this anapestic tetrameter. The second half is written entirely in amphibrachic tetrameter, perhaps signifying that finally, the time has come for Marcus's persona and his readers to build their industrial utopia, a process that each person with their workbenches and workshops can contribute to equally. 
I'd like to end with a few concluding thoughts just on this reading. And I have a quote here from Avram Sutzkever, who was able to meet Markish when he was airlifted from the Vilna ghetto to Moscow during World War I. And Sutzkever notes how the tragedy of Soviet Yiddish writers is not only that their tongues were sliced out and that their very lives hung on a single word, but especially that they had to distance and dissociate themselves from their most refined works. And Esther Markish notes how the bullet that was fired into the back of Markish, Parrot's Markish's head, took not only his whole life, but the life of the culture that had been his whole reason for being. Um, it's been a struggle to determine how to frame this long poem, Der Fetigera Kerman, as something that mythologizes a Soviet utopian society when we know in hindsight that this ultimately led to Markish's demise. But to reconcile this issue, I'd like to end with this quote from Svetlana Boim's Another Freedom that states, however tempting it is for contemporary novelists to speak about the victory read over read and imagine a plot of anyone against everyone, one should not just read history as a vicious cycle and end on the sour note that estrangement, just like nostalgia, is not what it used to be. A new beginning posits an alternative conjectural history that uncovers the genealogy of ideas that for a long time remain on the side roads of the prevailing versions of 20th century cultural history. They should be treated as unrealized possibilities, roads not taken, and unruined monuments to scientific errors. And with this, I'll end my talk that examines Marcus's Fetzigir Kerman as this sort of unrealized prophecy towards the industrial utopian project. Right. Thank you, Roy, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so we can move on to some audience questions. So first off, what drew you to this topic? How did you develop an interest in it? Um, how did you discover it? Yeah, so this is, I don't know, sort of a decade long topic or research interest in the making, I would say. I started studying Russian literature as an undergrad, primarily out of my personal interest in my family roots in history and uh, wanted to travel to Eastern Europe and learn more about the land that my great grandparents all emigrated from. And then when I decided to continue Russian literature in grad school, I realized that there's this entire corpus of Eastern European and Soviet Yiddish literature, at least up until the Second World War that, you know, I had no idea about. And when we talk about these roads not traveled or unruined monuments, this is sort of the alternative history, I think, for you know, my great grandparents and ancestors. So it's mainly out of personal interest, I would, I would say. Oh, wonderful. We have another question from the audience. Um, someone is asking, why does Mark Kesh feel so indebted to Jewish literary tradition? Why does he need the Psalms? And what, why does he need a Jewish and sometimes Christian narrative of, of redemption? Yeah, that's something that I examined in more detail in my dissertation. And I, I think it's interesting that Markish, especially initially, is so concerned with um, sort of as the futurists did, rejecting these past cultures of throwing, you know, as Mayakovsky and Khabnikov and Krushenik sought to throw Dostoevsky and Pushkin, Tolstoy from the ship of modernity, Markish tries to do the same with Jewish culture, but a lot has been made, um, particularly the research of David Schneer, who noted that Marcus subverts tradition or minds tradition in order to subvert it. And I think that he sort of, you know, his readership is still almost exclusively Jewish Yiddish speakers. And he uses um, sort of the repository of symbols and inner texts that you find in Jewish culture to perhaps make his statements regarding the future trajectory of Jewish peoples and their ideology in Europe stronger. Um, as for why he sort of relates on these prophetic modes and biblical intertexts in his portrayal or prophesizing of industrialization and the industrial utopian project, I think it adds this legitimacy to the project. Um, Markish also had a lot of 
sort of more propaganda-based work, um, such as the screenplay for the film, The Return of Nathan Becker, that was sent out to the United States to try to convince American Jews to move to the Soviet Union and partake in the industrialization of the country. Um, that Markish used things that would be accessible to a wide range of audience members and these inner texts coming from, you know, this prophetic mode and from, um, you know, that date back to the biblical times, I think legitimizes this mythology that he's trying to create. Um, the messianic imagery is something that also is sort of pervasive at this point in Yiddish expressionist um, poetry at a time when we think of Ori Svi Greenberg and his poem, Ori Svi on the cross or off the cross, that was um, sort of structured like a cross itself and ideas of Jewish Christ figures are things that sort of pervade the Yiddish avant-garde in the early part of the 20th century and is a big part of Yiddish expressionist writing at this time. Right, wonderful, we have time for another question or two from the audience. Um, so this one asks, um, this one mentions that there are several lines and images which appear in both of Markish's poems that you discussed today. Um, and this audience member is wondering, what does this overlap tell us about Markish's process of writing and revision or how his poems or how his poetic strategies move between composition of both poems? Yeah, this is a great question and something I'm sort of struggling to work through as um, some difficulties that arise in my research are also just the limited amount of concrete evidence that exists for when some of these poems were written, in particular, the 40-year-old man I found sort of contrasting notes, but the idea that, you know, it was started in 1920 to 1930, which comes from David Markish's, uh, Peretz Markish's son's Russian translation of the poem, sort of shows the fact that, you know, Markish started writing this poem at the same time that he writes De Kupe, which I think helps legitimize my argument that De Kupe could serve as a legitimate foundation point for Markish's ideological thought. Um, it's also interesting that, you know, it seems as if part one of Fertig Yeder Kerman was written while Markish was abroad, whereas part two was written as he returns to the Soviet Union in 1926. This hasn't been confirmed, but um, it seems plausible. And I, I think that the two sort of work hand in hand in terms of sort of demonstrating the maturity that Marcus goes through over the course of the 20s. Um, again, there's obviously this massive sort of warning or consideration to make that you don't want to read into something or create your own revisionist history. But I think that these um, lines that seem to repeat themselves in De Kupe, which was one of Marcus's most famous and probably most well-known poem, and Fertigera Kerman, which is Marcus's self-proclaimed magnum opus, sort of creates this level of continuity between the two that allows, at least, at least I hope allows me to legitimize these arguments that I'm trying to make. All right, wonderful. I think we'll end with one more question from the audience. So this audience member asks, do you think there are elements of ironic critique of Soviet utopia within the poema? I do, perhaps. Um, again, it's difficult to read irony into this poem, at least for me. Um, this is something where I think Esther Markish's memoir does leave some credibility to the sort of truthfulness of Marcus's poema and hopes for this industrial utopia. And I think it's obvious that there is this sort of, you know, definite desire and true belief, at least in the early parts of the 1920s, that Marcus truly saw um, the Soviet Union as a liberating force for the Jews and something that would allow Jewish Yiddish culture to thrive. Um, when Marcus comes to the realization that this is not the case, has you know, been noted and there's varying opinions. I think if we take the fact that, you know, Marcus finished the bulk of his work in the 1930s, I take a little less of an ironic view into the poem, but it's definitely a plausible consideration and something that I 
try to balance and try and still in the process of trying to find more and more support that will help add credence to my argument. Right, wonderful. So we, I think are gonna end because we are out of time, but thank you so much, Roy, for joining us today with this wonderful lecture. And thank you to our audience from all around the world for joining us as well. Um, have a good one. Great, thank you.